Philippians chapter 3, if you've got your Bible, you can turn there. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. And I want to read a passage that genuinely I believe God will speak to you personally. Now, if you don't know God, by the end of this experience, we believe something's going to happen. Just keep your heart open and, and dare to believe that all things are possible. Here's what Philippians 3, written by the Apostle Paul, is what he says. He says, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. We're living in a world where there's a lot of loss. There's a lot of things. But you know what Paul does? He goes, everything that I've got, I count that as loss. Indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge. Everyone say knowledge. That word knowledge is not intellectual. It's a knowing. It's a personal relational. Knowing the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him. Say no again. There's that word again, that I may know him. You hear this guy. Now, this guy's got an impressive CV. He's it. He's got it all. He's got everything together. And he says, everything I've got is nothing compared to the privilege of knowing, relationally knowing God and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal. Somebody shout goal. For the prize, somebody shout prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is what this man is saying. I press toward the goal for the prize. Do you know, I want to share with you for a few minutes the difference between the goal and the prize. Paul says, I'm going toward the goal for the prize. I mean, I want the prize, but I'm not aiming for the prize. I am aiming for the goal because if I hit the goal, I win the prize. You're not going to see in the NBA championship game seven, Kobe Bryant. Well, you're not going to see because he's retired, but anyone else. You're not going to see them with the game on the line. They can see the trophy in the corner there. They're not going to shoot the ball to the trophy even though they want the trophy. They're going to shoot the ball towards the goal because if you hit the goal, you win the prize. In soccer or football or whatever you call it, you're never going to hit towards the cup even though everyone has trained their entire life for the cup. They want the cup, but they aim for the goal. Paul says, I aim for the goal for the prize. In other words, he's saying, listen, you've got to know what you're aiming for. Now, in an athletics, you see Usain Bolt, and he's running or whoever. They're not going to halfway through the race stop and jump onto the dice, even though that's where they want to end up. They know if they hit the goal, they win the prize. Now, what's obvious in sport is not as obvious in life. What's as obvious, like we go, yeah, well, obviously. Well, in life, there are prizes that attract us. I believe that prize that God even wants for us. God wants us to have the prize, but you, you've got to go after the goal because if you hit the goal, you win the prize. But if you go after the prize, you may miss the goal and then miss the prize too. You know, I had a car, I think that you call it a Hyundai. I had a Hyundai. I worked as a lawyer and then I got saved. Now, you can have a saved lawyer, I'm just saying. I, I was a lawyer, I got saved, and when I was a lawyer, I drove a Hyundai. Now, all my friends drove BMWs, Audis, I don't know what you have here, Mercs, better cars than what I had, but I had no debt, praise God. So, I drove that Hyundai, but that Hyundai had a, had a mind of its own. Every so often, after a few months, it would start to veer off slightly towards its own, and I'd have to go and get wheel alignment, and I'd have to get it, and they'd just tweak a little thing a bit and then I get into there again and it goes straight again I'm like praise God six months later I go just veer off again and I'd have to get wheel alignment I feel like what God wants to do today is just align our hearts a little so that see because we're I'm not talking about guys going in the wrong direction we're going in the right direction but how many realize that if you go after the goal and you start aiming for the prize one year two years 10 years 25 years one degree off is a long way off and so I need this regularly in my life. I need to have my heart realigned constantly to make sure I, like the Apostle Paul who says, I've got everything, but I'm still aiming for the goal. 
Well, you should be by now saying, hey, what's the goal? What's the goal? Just give us the goal. The goal is very clear. It's to know Jesus. The goal is to know Christ. That's what Paul says. Listen, here's the goal. I count everything but lost for the sake of knowing God. You're like, and? See, the high achievers are like, yeah, know God, and then what? Like, what do we do? I don't think you understand. When you know Christ, you are invited into the most crazy adventure of a life. Anyone who thinks knowing Christ is boring is following the wrong God. I want to tell you, knowing Christ, people like, no, no Christ, well, then what? No, this is an invitation into a relationship, not a mind thing. He's not, God does not want to be studied. He wants to be known. Yeah. To know Christ is to actually be drawn into something that's deeper, that's higher, that's greater, that's wider. To know Christ is an invitation into a, the most life-changing adventure of a lifetime. You're like, but what am I going to do after that? There's, that will draw you into a life of purpose, a life of destiny. See, I grew up in a conservative background. Maybe there's some people like that in this room. Maybe you're online and you're listening and that's how you were. You grew up in a back. I grew up in a conservative background, like super conservative. I mean, super, super conservative. And I did not know God to be close. I knew him to be sovereign, but distant. I never knew that God wanted to be intimate and involved. And so when I started to have encounters with God and get to know this God, I'm like, this is a thrill. This is a rush. He's, the, he's greater than any drug. He's greater than any relationship. He's greater than anything. And I was like, I didn't know that's what God was like. I got sold some product that was not God. To know God is a, to, to be drawn into something far greater than just, oh, well, that's church, I guess. Now, there's a whole bunch of prizes that people want from God. Blessing, favor, increase, and I believe all of those things should follow. But they're not the goal. They're a prize. And Paul says, I press toward the goal for the prizes. See, this, this simple concept has been great, greatly used in my life to align me constantly. And I just want to give you three prizes that God wants you to have. Three prizes that he has got stored up, locked up, literally waiting, hanging over the church LV, hanging over your house, hanging, hanging over your family, and it's waiting for you. But make sure it never becomes the goal of your life. And if you keep pursuing Christ, these things will come. Number one, recognition. Recognition. Everybody say recognition. Recognition. I believe God wants everybody to be celebrated, not just tolerated. The scripture says we are to be the head and not the tail, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And I, I absolutely believe we should celebrate people. Every time God influences the world through someone or anybody, let's not have a negative uh jealous competitive spirit let's continue to celebrate what the lord is doing in your brother in your sister in your neighbor that's the way it should be what god has done in our church is remarkable it's a miracle i don't understand it either we had a young new christians girl in our church when we first started 11 years ago she got into politics and she's now one of the nation national figures in malaysia god has elevated people we have people from all sorts of profile coming in just like you would and as we see them come in we celebrate them we pray for them we don't embarrass them we we don't humiliate them. We don't say, be humble. We, we, we allow recognition to happen. Just last year, we hosted the premier of our state, and we did all of that, and I don't begrudge any of that. But do you realize that all the recognition in the world will come, but it will also go? And recognition is a wonderful prize, but it, it's a horrible goal. You know, I want to honor all the veterans too. I want to add an amen. We love the United States because of this. They honor people. And, and, you know, but I can guarantee you without knowing any of the veterans who stood to this morning that none of them served for this moment or the thank you. They served because of their love of their country. So, so recognition now comes and it's a wonderful prize, but they never set out to serve with recognition as their goal. You know, Jesus had recognition. My gosh, that guy had recognition. Before Facebook, he had friends. And before Instagram, he had followers. Jesus was recognized. He had to hide. I don't, I don't know if they had disguises back then. But listen, he had, he had miracles. He, you name it, there was crowds everywhere. But I tell you something, Jesus knew that recognition was never the goal of his life. It was a prize. If, 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 if recognition became the goal of Jesus' life, when they tried to make him king, he would have gone, finally. 
He got it. Yes, it's me. Do you know there's some miracles Jesus did and he told him, don't tell anyone. I'm like, I wouldn't have done that. I would have been like, tell everyone. Instagram it and tag me. Jesus, what about the testimony? Sometimes we just got to make sure that recognition is a wonderful prize to celebrate when it comes, but easy come, easy go. I've got an embarrassing story, but I'll tell you anyway. I used to be a keyboard player, as you heard. And uh, many years ago, uh, for the church I was in, we used to do this Christmas thing, and the thousands of people would come out. And uh, just before uh, the, the Christmas production, um, there was invariably months of preparation. And I'd be the keyboardist, and... And I would have to teach the, the singers their harmonies and teach the, the bass player their part and the brass their part. And we'd do this whole thing. I was working as a lawyer. I was a volunteer. But I did everything for the Lord. Three months before this Christmas one year, I think it was, might have been the year 2000. I can't remember exactly which year. But the worship pastor took leave of absence for three months. So the pastor said to me, I'm the assistant. He said, can you take on the project? I'm like... Sure, it's for the Lord. I'll do it. And so I spent three months, three nights a week, three months practicing, doing everything, got it all ready. And then the week before the actual production, uh, the pastor said, okay, this guy's back. I'm like, okay, no worries. So I sat down with him and I said, this is what we practice. This, 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 the order of songs, how are we going to do it? Go for it. It'll be great. The night comes. It's huge. Thousands of people. Fireworks, you name it. It was awesome. I'm sitting there so proud of the guys cheering them on. We nailed it. Every note we did, we did, we did black songs and we weren't even black. We were, we, were, we were awesome in our own eyes. Anyway, the, the whole thing went brilliantly until the pastor gets up to do the vote of thanks. So he gets up and he says, how many people enjoy? He thanked a whole lot of people. Then he said, who loved the music? And everyone goes, yeah. And, you know, at that point you start taking the humble look. He goes, it's all because of one man. One man has put in hours for the lie. And so I'm like, you know, the humble look, in case you, you don't know, is where you sort of fiddle with the... Hem of your garment, just very. <laughs> and, you know, all the choirs turn and looking at me. All the guys are looking at me. He's put in hours and he gives this huge build up. He goes, ladies and gentlemen, give a big hand to. And then he says the wrong name. He thanks the guy who did nothing for three months. The guy who was on leave of absence. I'm over it. I'm just telling you the story, though. <laughs> he, he thanks the wrong guy. Now, I was fine if nobody got credit. But 5,000 people are cheering for the wrong guy. They're cheering for the wrong guy. And so now it's real tough because you've got to look all humble. And you can't look angry because then you think you've got pride. So you're just smiling and you're like, he's looking like, I did nothing. I'm like, we know you did nothing. And we're all just clapping. And I'm like, ah. You know, I sulked for about a day and a half. For about a day and a half. And, you know, you can't look like you care because then people think you've got issues. But my reaction showed me something about myself. My reaction showed me that somewhere along the line, recognition went from being a prize to becoming the goal. And like my Hyundai, that reaction was a God. I remember the Lord speaking to me saying, son, have you, uh, are you done? Are you done? Like, really? Are you done? I was like, sorry, Lord, I repent. And you know, you know what that was? There was the Lord going... Uh, that's right, Lord. I set out. It was all about you. I wanted to serve you. I wanted to worship you. I want to do everything for you. I live for you. I give for you. I breathe for you. I do all that I do for you. But God, somewhere along the line, recognition just became my Hyundai. I just started to veer off a little. And I said, God, touch me. Let me be like the Apostle Paul. I press toward the goal. Thank you for the prize when it comes. Thank you for the prize when it goes. But may it never be the goal of my life. May it never be the goal. You know, people come, I don't know why people come to Vegas who are not from Vegas, but I got an idea. I mean, you guys have been in our prayers the last few weeks, everything that's happened in the city. You need to know from the other side of the world, not only do we love your pastors, therefore we love you as an extension of that. And so Vegas gets a lot of recognition in movies and all sorts of stuff. But if you set your heart with recognition as the goal of your life, you will be greatly disappointed. It is a wonderful prize that comes on the, f on the path. Of now I get credit for things I don't even do. Like, he's done this and he's done this. I'm like, I didn't really do any of that. <laughs> recognition is a prize. Live loosely with it. Second, second prize, quickly, I've got to keep move, moving. Second prize is results. Huh? Listen, 
My three points today are lust, greed, and hate. That would be easy. That means the Hyundai is driving in the wrong direction. We're talking about cars going in the right direction, but every now and then we veer off and we start aiming for the wrong thing. See, results, you, 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 let me remind you, Jesus demands fruitfulness. He demands it. The parable of the talents show us that. The tree that didn't bear fruit shows us that. The master and the servants, all those talents and those parables show us that. Stewardship. God says, increase, multiply, increase, multiply. I amen and absolutely believe the church LV is about to accelerate and spread into other cities and other states. You're a part of that. That's not a prophecy over a constitution or a board or a couple. That's a prophecy over you. And that idea that this thing can grow and the results could come and multiplication could happen is wonderful. But it's not the goal of life. It's the prize that comes with the goal. Jesus had so many results. Man, if all the works that he did were written, the Bible says there's not enough space to contain the books. That's a result filled three years. That's a pretty busy three years. Healing, salvations, life change, miracles, you name it. But I tell you, if Jesus was, if results was the goal of Jesus' ministry, he wouldn't have preached the Dracula message. My brother got it. Yeah, eat my flesh, drink my blood. That's an Australian thing. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. It's like not number one on the online podcast. Like Peter's like, oh man, Jesus, really? Don't do that one. And you don't even say, it's a metaphor, it's a hyperbole, I'm using figurative language. Eat my flesh, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, and one by one they all leave. And Jesus is not fast, because results were a prize, they were never the goal. Do you know, he wouldn't have gone to the smaller towns if results were the goal, goal of his life. He wouldn't have driven people out of the temple, he would have gone, oh, at least they're there. Let's keep him here, and like the frog in water, let's slowly turn the temperature up. J Jesus couldn't care less. He loved the whole world. But he was never results-driven. Do you know, I had a pretty bad week in October 2001. I know it's a long time ago, but it makes the point. In the same week, I got made redundant from my job. My girlfriend broke up with me. And I contracted hepatitis A, which meant I was contagious and nobody could hang out with me in case they catch it. Now, you probably had worse weeks in your life. But for me, that was at the time a bad week. And, uh, you know, if one of those things happen, it's not so bad because if you bre break up with your girlfriend, you throw yourself into your job, but I had no work. If you, if, if you lose your job, you go hang out with your girlfriend, but I didn't have a girlfriend or a job. And if you lose your job, and your girlfriend, you go hang out with your, your mates, but you got hepatitis A, so you're in quarantine and nobody's allowed to touch you. So I'm like lonely, broke, and single. Now, no big deal, but you know what I started doing? Sulking. Oh, God. Is this what I get for serving you? I'm generous. I'm da, 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 da. And you know, it was, again, that reaction of, where results had somehow become, and you know, here, here are, here's the encouragement for those of you that are flourishing. Bless God. Thank God you're flourishing. But here's the word for those of you who are struggling. Bless God. If you, listen, knowing Christ has to be the goal. There will be seasons of plenty and there will be seasons of lack. There will be seasons of trial and there will be seasons of flourishing. But I want to tell you, results are never to become the goal. You know, this does not just happen for those of you who don't realize. This happens in ministry. This happens in churches. I now go from become a lawyer to a pastor. I'm now holy, not. And so I start, I start preaching, and, and the pastor's like, hey, you know, he's encouraging me. My former pastor, this is before we started Kingdom City. We just, you know, just got into ministry. And he's like, man, you're a great preacher. I'm like, humble look. Yeah. Hey, I'd moved on. I'd learned from my piano days. And he's like, you know, when you preach, people get saved. You know, more than when I preach, more when other pastors preach, he was just trying to encourage me. And I'm like, yeah, that's right, recognition, whatever. Cool. And so, you know, the funny thing happened. Next time I preached, no one got saved. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. I'm sure Billy Graham would have had a bad day. <laughs> Next time I preached, I've met, no one got saved. Now, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, at the end of every experience, you get the opportunity to experience the God I'm talking about. Now, here I am as a pastor. This is how honest I'm being with you. As a pastor. And I'm like, that's two services, two experiences. No one bit of God. Third one, no one. I'm thinking, my pastor's cursed me. 
He has jinxed me. I have, now, I have now a hex over my life. He has taken the anointing from me. Call me Ichabod. Call me something horrible. But I am clearly lost it. And, and, and I thought, I know what I'll do. Next time I'm going to fast and pray. So I fasted and prayed. That I prepared. I visualized. I envisaged. I dreamt. I conceptualized. I had the Afro keyboard guy. He was there the whole service. You know, when you have the keyboard and stuff, the whole service, it means things are going to happen, right? Yeah, that's on the whole time. And I'm ready. I'm, I didn't even think I even preached a sermon. I didn't want theology to get in the way of my altar call. And so I'm getting ready for somebody to respond. And I, I'm doing this all for the wrong reasons, but I'm ready. And so I'm like, oh, come on. And then I'm going to close your eyes. The, eye, the light was good. Everything was perfect. Give your lives to God. Nobody puts their hand up. I'm like, you're not hearing me, church. You're not hearing me tonight. Shut your eyes again. I, w I made a fool of myself. I said, if you've even thought one bad thought this week, nobody put their hand up. I hand over to the mic to the pastor. I walk up and I'm depressed. I'm like, I'm quitting ministry. It's over. And I'm pretending to worship. You know when you pretend to worship? See, those of you that don't worship, at least you, you make it clear. You're like, <laughs> you're better than what I was that day, which is pretending to worship, but I'm complaining to God. And I'm like, oh my God, I, don't, I can't believe it. And God said something to me in that moment that I will never forget till the day I die. He said, son, if no one ever got saved again under your ministry, would you still serve me? And I'm like, and I start crying. I'm like, God, is that a trick question? <laughs> I'm not sure. I think I thought you wanted it. Right. Of course God wants the whole world saved. But what he was saying is, listen, would you serve me in the back? Would you serve me in the car park? Would you serve me in the hospitality? Would you serve me in the kids? Does it really matter? Because somewhere along the line, even as a minister, even as a pastor, results became the goal of my life. And God was tweaking my heart again. He's saying, son, listen, let me do to your, to your heart what I did to your Hyundai. Let me just align. Ah, make the goal that I may know Christ and Christ alone. Everything else I can count but loss for the knowledge to know him that's why Matthew 7 21 I think is the scariest verse in the Bible he says on that day many will say to me Lord Lord did we not what are they doing listing off their prizes their results I did this I planted this I went there I went this I did that and he'll go what is Jesus response I don't know you. I don't know you. Knowing you was the goal. I don't know you. I don't know you. You were aiming for the goal, but you, you, you veered off and you've got this impressive CV, but you've missed the goal. I don't know you. He didn't say, I'm not impressed. Results are wonderful, but he, he, Jesus' response is saying, you missed the goal. I don't know you. Knowing you, knowing you, knowing you, knowing you. That was the whole point. You, miss, you went after the prizes and you even got them, but you missed the goal. You know, to those who are struggling and to those that are flourishing, God doesn't want to be used. He wants to be known. He doesn't want to be studied. He wants to be known. And finally, relationships. What? What? Relationships. Relationships are a prize. Relationships will come. And relationships will go. And if you decide that this Christianity thing is for you because of the relationships, as the goal, you will be sorely devastated. It's a prize. I am so grateful for the friends. God said it's not good for man to be alone. I have got sermons and catalogs of them on isolation and how it'll destroy your destiny and how we need small groups and we need community. And if you're not in a small group, you need one. You need to join the growth track. You need to take the next step. You need to say, I'm going to be a part of dedicated. You need to do whatever you got to do to not be on your own and isolated. I'm a huge believer. I'm a huge preacher. I'm a huge, absolute standing on the word of God, hand on heart, declaring that we are members of a body and we're meant to be connected, not disconnected. And all of that is absolutely true but relationships are a prize they're not the goal I remember a guy came to Christ and and as I led him through the new Christians thing he came from a Hindu background it was another religion and and uh, as he came uh he said you know you said God will give me the desires of my heart I'm like yeah he will He's like, I want to get married. I'm like, let's pray together. He's like, yeah, we'll get, I want to get married. And I said, he, he says, I think I know who God wants me to marry. I'm like, who? And he, and he named a woman who was already married. I'm like, oh. 
oh, we missed that in the new Christian's Next Step track. Oh, flip. He'll give you the desires of your heart, but not another woman who's married. <sighs> How do I explain this to him? So I explained it to him. He's like, come on. Come on. And it became very clear that he was following Christ because he wanted the, this woman. And that we became, it all came out. Now, you might go, Phew, that kid's immature. Listen, sometimes it might not be because you want to marry someone else's wife, but it might be, you know, betrayal, loss, when people hurt you, is some of the most hurtful things. But you can shake that stuff off because you didn't get into following God for them. You got into following God for him. When I decided to go to Malaysia and plant a church, my family said, you're crazy. You're mad. Why would you do that? I had an encounter with God, and I sold my house, bought a one-way ticket to an Islamic country to plant a church without a visa. That's dumb. Unless God's in it. And now we can see God's in it. But I can tell you at the time, people are like, all your family are here. All your friends are here. Why would you leave all of this to go over there? I want to tell you that relationships are a wonderful prize. I'm glad for the friendships God has given us. I'm glad for the people God has given us. But I want to tell you that relationships must never be the goal of your life. You can be single and be in love with God and absolutely fulfilled and committed. You can be divorced. You can be widowed. You can be married. You can be whatever. Relationships, thank you, God, for them. But, Lord, I can live with or without them because you are the goal. You are the magnificent obsession of my life. Jesus knew it. I want to tell you Jesus was single. People think single, oh, well, I'm, I'm not really complete till I'm married. Jesus was fully complete. Do you know if relationships were the goal, he wouldn't have invited all his friends to leave after the Dracula message. So you guys want to go? He was not, they deserted him and he stayed true. Because the goal was to know the Father. I close with this story. Let's get the keyboardist up. Brother, you probably have a name, but I've called you Afro. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Here he comes from the back. What, Jalen? Jalen's your name? I think you're Indian. <laughs> you, think I'm, you think I'm African-American, don't you? <laughs> no, don't, don't, say, don't say anything. That's fine. <clears throat> okay. Anyway. Next... The next experience, I'll be speaking on unity, so you can come back for that. <laughs> I remember one night, I'll close with this. One night, I, had, I heard a knock. Uh, I was fast asleep, and I had a crazy dream. I've never had a dream like this before or since. And in my dream, I hear a knock on the door. And in my dream, I literally walk to the door, and I open the door. And as soon as I open the door, I'm not given to heaps of visitations and all that stuff, but I knew it was a demonic presence. And as I opened the door, I could see this demonic thing there. And I'm like, in my dream, going, Mark, shut the door. That's not good. Shut the door. And yet, as I tried to shut the door, this thing marched on in as if I wasn't there. It's like as if, you know, I don't know if you've ever had a dream where you have no muscles. Clearly, it was a dream because in real life, I've got lots. And um, I couldn't shut the door. And this thing keeps coming in. And I'm panicking. I'm like, this thing's freaking me out. It's this presence. I've never seen anything like it before or since. And as it's coming in, it becomes so frightening, this demonic experience. I wake up, and as soon as I wake up, I realize it's not a dream. I'm alone in the house. I'm single. It's only me in the house. And I, it's probably 2 in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, and I'm wide awake, and I can't physically get up because there's a physical thing in my room, and it's choking me. And I'm trying to pray in English in tongues and something to try and just, oh, where is this? I'm thinking, what on earth is this? And after about 10 minutes of wrestling with this thing, this thing leaves and peace fills the room. But I'm scared. I put the light on. And I'm like, God, what on earth was that? Where did that thing come from? I haven't been involved in the occult. I haven't watched Harry Potter. I haven't done any of those things. I'm like going through my mental list. What did I open the door? I, I can't remember opening the door. I'm like, God, you better speak to me. So I open the book and I start reading from the book of Ezekiel. And God says there that in that day I will give them one heart. The word one is not singular one. It's the word undivided. He says, I'm going to give them a whole heart. It's an, it's, it's an undivided heart. And God began to speak to me that I had divided my heart. Because in my, in my dream, I said to the Lord, why can't I shut the door? Why am I so, I thought we, I thought greater is he that's in me. I thought I have victory. Why couldn't I do that? And God said to me, whatever you give your heart to has the right to walk into your life anytime. 
And I said, but I thought I'd given my heart to you. And little did I realize that that was a big alignment moment in my life where God was saying, listen, maybe you gave your heart to recognition. Maybe you gave your heart to results. Maybe you gave your heart to relationship. I said, God, I take, my, I take the keys back from all of them and I give it to you. I didn't realize that you can have a divided heart even as a Christian. Then it made sense to me why he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Not part of your heart, not even the first part of your heart, with all of your heart. That does not mean you can't love your spouse or your kids or, your, or, or what you do. In fact, the greatest husband I'll ever be is when God has all of my heart. The greatest dad I'll ever be is when God has all of my heart. The greatest pastor I'll ever be to my church is when God has all of my heart. That night, I began to, I journaled and I felt the jealousy of God like I've never felt before. And God is not jealous because he's insecure. He's jealous because he's madly in love with you. He is so in love with you. And I felt, the jealous, I felt the touch of God so clearly. And I began to write and God began to speak to me. He said, son, one day you'll have a wife. She won't have your heart. I'll have your heart. One day you'll have kids. They won't have your heart. I'll have your heart. One day you'll have churches. It won't have your heart. I'll have your heart. One day you'll have money. It won't have your heart. I'll have your heart. And I felt the, 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 the jealousy of God that he wanted all of me. And I surrendered everything. And listen, that's before I had anything. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have churches, I didn't have kids, I had nothing. And God was saying to me, saying something that I still come to regularly. And you know, maybe in this incredible place, maybe on the verge of the explosion and the acceleration that God is about to bring into your life, into this church, it's a wonderful moment to say, God, may you forever be the magnificent goal of my life. I thank you for the prizes of recognition that are coming. I thank you for the relationships that are coming. I thank you, Lord, for the results that are about to flow. But God, may you be, may you be, may you be, may be knowing Christ be the only only thing that I'm after you know the next 20 days the next 30 days I remember going to bed before I go to bed I'm like God I'm just checking if I give you my heart again all of it my favorite song for that next month was Lord I give you my heart give you my I'd sing it over and over again it just became my, but you know what God was doing in that season? Just aligning my heart, saying, son, this is who you are. This is what it's about. This is what, and I, see, the Lord wants to bless you outrageously, but he would rather you make sure that he's forever the goal. It's like God was saying, listen, I'm the goal. I'm the goal. Look at me. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You know what I loved about the worship we, we just had? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus, you know what I believe God's about to do now in these last few minutes? is just align every heart. And you know what? All of us, like my Hyundai, need that alignment every now and then. And you know what? It's just waiting there and saying, Holy Spirit, I thank you. Maybe some of us, the wheel alignment's massive. Maybe others of it's just, just a little tweak. But everybody needs this regularly. Paul the apostle needed it. He said, listen, I'm letting you know. I make a list of everything and I count it as loss. I count it as dung. I count it as rubbish compared to the knowledge of knowing him. He wasn't despising results. He wasn't despising recognition or relationships. But he said, compared to knowing him, that I may know him, I press toward the goal for all these wonderful prizes. Thank you, God. Bring him more, Lord. But Lord, may you forever be the goal of my life. There are people here this morning and you are feeling discouraged that there's been failure and, and that reaction of how you feel because of what's not happened and because of what has happened. Today, the Lord wants to lift that off your life because if you know Christ, you're on track. You're on track. We don't compete. We don't compare. And every now and then we say, Father, align my heart again. You know, some people are like, you know what? Good, the young people need to hear this message. I thought the older the car, the more the wheel alignments. Uh, it's not a good weekend to say anything about, but you know what? You've got great old people here, I'm just saying. This is something that never gets old. It's not like, oh, young people. You know, the young people who have their first love for God, that's not the starting point. That's their high point. 